Hi, Artemis Paint here. There's been something going on in matched betting and most match bettors don't know about it. No one seems to talk about this. No one seems to want to talk about this. And in this video, I will expose match betting's dirty secret. Matched betting is a way of getting bookmakers bonuses and turning them into real money. So this is the match betting funnel. Most people who start match betting have seen an ad that match betting isn't gambling. They then sign up to some site which offers access to odds matching software. The odds matching software sites teach the back and lay method for extracting money from bonuses. They recommend that their customers back their selections at the bookmaker and lay the same bet off at the betting exchanges. You might notice that I've written the inferior back and lay method. I've been match betting for around three years and I only use this method occasionally. I use it when I have to. It's the second best method by a long way. I use a method called dutching for all football matches and some horse races. This is a subject for another video. However, I will say that using just the back and lay method not only keeps ma uh, match betters dumbed down, but it also keeps them dependent on their software. Thirdly, they show you offers and encourage you to go to the bookmakers via their links. They also have links embedded in their match betting software. Many of these links may be affiliate links. I'm not saying all of the links are affiliate links. I'm saying that if you click on a link on these sites, it might be an affiliate link. Fourthly, you collect your welcome bonuses from the bookmakers. Fifthly, some of them try to shape unsuspecting match bettors into becoming gamblers. The shaping of the match betters belief system starts as soon as they enter the site. And this is a very sneaky process. Now, the focus of this video is on point five. However, I do want to talk about points three and four as well, because they're all related. So let's start with affiliate links. This is how it works if the odds matching software site is using affiliate links. If they're not using affiliate links, it doesn't work this way. And that applies for the remainder of this video. When I say anything, I mean some sites and not all sites, and I'm not naming any sites. The match better signs up to an odds matching software site. He'll pay around £15 a month for access to odds matching software and advice on how to make money from the bookmakers. Remember, because this is important, the match better is paying for advice and not just access to the software. The site shows all the bookmaker offers. Many have affiliate links that take you straight to the bookmaker. The odds matching software may also contain affiliate links for both bookmakers and betting exchanges. An affiliate gets paid money from the bookmaker and the betting exchange when the match better loses money. In other words, if you click on these links and sign up to a bookmaker, the person or company that owns the affiliate link gets commission when you lose money. It depends what deal the affiliate has. However, most bookmakers and casinos give commission for as long as the customer's life at the bookmaker or casino. So the odds matching software provider may be an affiliate for both the bookmaker and the betting exchange. Now, the affiliate won't make much money at first because the match better will win at either the bookmaker or the exchange. So if the match better wins at one, he'll lose at the other. Therefore, the two bets will have cancelled each other out for the affiliate as well as the match better. So the obvious way that the affiliate can make real money in this situation is if the match better only plays at the bookmaker or the betting exchange. 
So if he can find some way of convincing the match better to play at the bookmaker, but not the exchange, the affiliate stands to make money. Now, I'm not concerned about what the affiliate earns. It's about them having an incentive to screw the match better. There's a potential conflict of interest for the odds matching software provider because he gets paid by the match better for advice and is getting paid by the bookmaker when the match better loses money. One thing matched betters have to worry about is getting their bookmaker accounts restricted. This is also known as getting gubbed in match betting and trading circles. So my first question is this. If the bookmaker has to pay the affiliate for a match better's losses on an ongoing basis, does the bookmaker know what website the matched better came from when he signed up? Does the bookmaker know that the customer came from a website that teaches matched betting? Well, I can't be sure. However, there are three possible answers. If the answer is yes, match bettors who go to the bookmakers via these affiliate links may already be under scrutiny. If they do know, you have to question the loyalty to the customer of the odds matching software providers. In most cases, customers are paying the odds matching software providers a monthly fee. And as I've said, they're paying them for advice as well as um, access to the software. Getting your account restricted does not help you make money. So if the answer is no, the bookmaker doesn't know that the match better came from a website that teaches match betting, it's fine to click on the affiliate links. And if the answer is you don't know, you probably shouldn't go via the links. Why take the risk? You don't get anything extra unless the affiliate has an exclusive offer that no other affiliate is allowed to offer. And by the way, affiliate links to exchanges are fine. Betting exchanges aren't going to gub you. However, be aware that Betfair has a sports book and their business is linked to Paddy Power. So, I have another question. If bookmakers don't like match bettors, why do they allow the matched betting websites to put their links on their website? I mean, if you had a business and you thought a bunch of people were going to make you financially poorer, you wouldn't pay someone to get these people to turn up at your business, would you? The best way to explain this is by analogy. I read in a scientific journal once that one in ten people who ever drink alcohol end up with a drink problem. I mean, I don't know if that's true, but that's what I read. But if we move that analogy to the gambling scenario, there's probably some statistic of a percentage of people gambling ending up with a gambling problem. I've looked it up and I couldn't find a clear number, but the numbers that I've seen estimated range from 1% to 5%. In other, in, in other words, 1% to 5% of people who ever gamble um, end up with a gambling pro problem. Now, that doesn't mean that the other 95 to 99% are completely disciplined when they're faced with slot machines and roulette wheels. Players will have various degrees of discipline, however only a small percentage will fall into the category of problem gambler. In other words, I'm saying that a percentage of match bettors will lose control and become proper gamblers. I'm not saying this is why there's a special relationship between the odds-matching software providers and the bookmakers. However, it is something to think about. So the first stage is that match bettors collect the standard welcome bonuses and they end up with around £1,000. At this stage, the odds-matching software provider has his customers' complete trust. After all, they said you would get £1,000 and they fulfilled that part of the promise. 
You have to remember that those bookmaker bonuses were always there. These guys didn't give you the money. I mean, you see these bonuses advertised everywhere, for example, on TV commercial breaks during sports programmes. Now, at this stage, or at some stage, you might start to feel a little bit anxious because you know that the welcome bonuses will end at some point and you can't figure out how you're going to make the up to £500 a month for life or whatever they told you you would get, after you've completed your welcome offers. You might not have had any gubbings yet, however, you will be aware that others have, and you'll have heard of mug betting. Now, I want to talk about gubbings because I believe that the way that they they present this is a major part of the shaping process. So, I'll briefly give a few reasons why people get gubbed. Then I'll tell you what they say. You decide who makes the most sense. The first reason match bettors get gubbed is because they back horses blindly. Now I do midweek horse racing and I do back and lay these, but I don't get gubbed and people who pay for software and advice do. They tell you you can get 80% from your free bet. I do get a little less, unless my horse wins and best odds guaranteed kicks in. But that's the price I'm willing to pay to avoid getting gubbed. On the forums, they think that they get gubbed because the bookmakers know they found a close match on the odds. They think that because that's all they know about horse racing. It's so much easier than that. I mean, I could teach an average horse racing punter. In 15 minutes, I could teach him how to catch match betters. And I'm not kidding. You see, normal horse racing punters read the form. Most don't read form to a particularly sophisticated level, but they will look at certain variables. They don't treat a horse race like it's an alternative version of a roulette wheel. They choose horse racing because they believe they can beat the bookie by reading form. A long time ago, I was interested in horse racing and used to read form. And in the betting shops, they used to have pages of the sporting life stapled to the wall. Now, if I went into a betting shop, I would see punters look at a page with the list of runners in the race, then they would move across to the page which, with each horse, horse's racing history and read how, they ran, uh, how the horse ran in its last race and other details about the race, such as the distance and the going. So when these match betting mugs pick a horse where there's a close match between the back and lay odds and then close their eyes and bet, they could be betting on anything. And if they end up betting on a third or fourth favourite with a lousy form in a low-grade race such as a seller, it will look suspicious. Now you might think, well, doesn't this make me look like a mug? No, because a mug who bets on these types of horses would probably bet on every race on the card. The The mug match better, by contrast, has a qualifying bet and a free bet to bet every week, and he probably doesn't bet any more, much more than that. A normal punter would be more selective about which horses to bet on if he had two bets per week. I mean, even a mug wouldn't make a special trip to the bookies to bet on the third favourite um, in a cellar or any other low class of race. So this leads to the next point, and that your betting pattern must be consistent in terms of the personality that you're trying to project. When you do very little betting on top of qualifying bets and free bets, this makes you look like a cautious punter. However, when you pick a third favourite in a bad race, you're projecting yourself as a loose gambler. This is inconsistent. You have to be aware of your own image. So what does a cautious punter bet on? Well, favourites. 
and not just favourites, but favourites with good form. It's not normal to get gubbed. I mean, if everyone was getting gubbed, bookmakers wouldn't have any customers. I've had four gubbings in three years, and three of those were right at the start. I learnt from these, and I know why I got gubbed. My fourth gubbing was carelessness on my part, and that was more recent. So anyway, the next two points are the reasons why I got gubbed. The first gubbing was for using a method to get more money from my free bet. It was mathematically, statistically sound, and there was pretty much no risk. Basically, I was placing all my free bets on the nil-nil correct score and placing two other bets at two other bookmakers and usually, well, always in this case, one bet at the exchange in play. But to anyone who knows anything about betting methods, what I was doing was obvious. In fact, I'm sure anyone who's watching this video who has an interest in trading on football can guess what my method was all about. Now, I could have sold this as a profitable method and told people to go into the casino to hide what they're doing, but I didn't, because I know I got gub for this, and you would as well. I also know that going into the casino is not going to conceal someone back putting all their free bets on the nil-nil correct score. So, it was naive of me, but I learnt from this. And what's interesting is that all the money that I won from this was at the exchange. I lost every single free bet at the bookmaker. So, despite the bookmaker not losing money, he still gubbed me. Also, the correct score market is usually bad at the bookies compared to the exchanges. And this is actually why I believed I could get away with what I was doing. I mean, I was taking bad odds. So, I was taking bad odds and the bookie still gubbed me. The point is that you can have a mathematically sound method, but if the bookmakers can see right through it, you will get gubbed. From the bookie's point of view, he recognised the system I was using, and he knew that I will abuse any bonus that I'm offered in the future. They will only delay gubbing you if, you, they, know, if they know you're using a system, because they want to see if you lose your discipline and start gambling. If you don't, you'll be out of the door. And, yeah, with free bets, if you, some, you see some offers for free bets where the only way you can um, get the free bet is by doing something that would look fairly obvious to a bookmaker. And if your only possible strategy is um, to get a free bet is by doing something that you think a bookmaker would recognise as some kind of system, or in their words, bonus abuse, you probably shouldn't go for the free bet. So the next reason I got gubbed was variation in stakes. It took me two gubbings to figure this one out. If you bet, say, £30 on a football team at 2.0, you need to keep your stake within this range for football teams with similar types of odds. It doesn't have to be £30 every time. You can bet a range of, say, between £20 and £50, and even more for more highly publicised events. What you don't want to do is suddenly bet £5 on a team with uh, odds that you would normally bet much higher on. They don't gub you straight away for this. I mean, I was varying my stake for quite a long time like this before I got gubbed. And my fourth, what I call careless gubbing, was at a bookie where I had a similar variation in stakes. So, um, I mentioned clicking on affiliate links. That's a maybe um, as a reason for getting gubbed. Um... In addition, only going after offers is another problem, which is solved by dutching. So, I've written as the title, They Know You Will Get Gubbed. How do I know that? Because they keep telling you that you will get gubbed. The implication is, it's not their fault that you'll get gubbed. Everyone gets gubbed. Then they try and traffic you into the casino. They say that playing in the casino will help you stop getting gubbed. 
Well, I've never played in a casino. I just stick to football and horse racing. So what I want you to understand here is that I'm not telling you about gubbings just for the sake of it. I'm explaining this because this difference is key to how a person will behave. If you believe what I tell you, you'll feel that gubbings are within your control. Your actions at the bookmaker control whether or not you get gubbed. You control gubbings by looking like a normal football and horse racing punter. You're willing to avoid bonuses that don't fit your profile because you don't feel as time limited and you believe that you can take money from the bookies for years. If you believe what they tell you, you'll believe that gubbings are generally not within your control. You'll feel that they're kind of random and happen to everyone eventually. However, you might be able to delay gubbings by playing in the casino. Now, this is key to them for several reasons. If you feel dependent on the software, you're more likely to stay and pay a subscription fee. If they tell you you should expect to make 80% out of your free bet, you'll feel that you need to, the software to find these close matches. Then there's the question of whether or not you should take an offer. They need to fill their site with offers to justify the £15 a month subscription fee after someone has done all their welcome offers. They need to convince you that there are so many offers around that you can make up to £500 a month for life or whatever they claimed. So it may be about taking any offer on anything, golf, tennis, boxing, NFL, baseball, casino, bingo... I mean, it's going to be pretty difficult to make someone believe that they can make huge amounts of money and at the same time tell them they, they, that they should reject a lot of offers to make themselves appear as though they're a normal punter. Okay, then they have systems based on numbers, based on odds, but the systems look obvious to the bookmaker. And I'm talking about all these ACA systems which... Uh, I'll talk about later, but they must really be obvious to bookmakers. And then they've created an excuse to get people into the casino. Remember what I said earlier about affiliates making more money if they can cut the betting exchange out? Well, you can't lay a casino bet, can you? So this view on gubbings appears to match a business model. Now, this could be a total coincidence, of course. I'm not saying they've got this view because um, it helps their business. But imagine you had a job in a bookmaker's and you were asked to look through a customer's accounts and find match betters. So you see someone whose bets usually seem to be associated with some kind of offer. The customer usually places their free bets at odds of around four or five, and they place their qualifying bets at lower odds, usually. The customer places really short price stackers quite frequently. Ask yourself, how difficult would it be for you to see such a pattern? OK, so let's add one more thing. You notice that this customer ha loses a few quid in the casino. Would this last point make the betting pattern of this customer in the sports book invisible to you? Would you think, oh yeah, right, he lost a few quid in the casino, so he can't be a match better. All that stuff in the sports book, that's like just a coincidence. It just looks the same as a match better, but it's a coincidence. Phew, I almost gubbed an innocent man. Anyway, let's look what happens after the welcome bonuses. So, even though the software sites put more or less any bonus up, they're kind of stuck for offers after you've completed all the main welcome bonuses. They have two sources of revenue from you, your monthly subscription and the revenue from your losses at the bookies. 
That's if you've used their affiliate links. They try to convince you that you should be able to make sums of money that are almost impossible to make regularly. And there'll be people on the forum claiming that they make loads of money as well. Well, a lot of people will say that to try and impress others. I mean, I've met gamblers who are obviously losing gamblers who try to make out they're winning gamblers. And remember, the odds matching software providers have a lot of affiliates of their own and it's in their financial interest to make people believe that they make huge sums of money. I mean, what they're trying to say is, I make loads of money and so can you. Um, so... The main bonus offers will be the free bet clubs and the odd free bet. They'll have a list of offers and the lot will be far too much trouble for the money. And although there aren't many bonuses on a weekly basis, there'll still be bonuses for highly publicised events such as the World Cup, the Champions League, big horse race meetings such as Royal Ascot and Glorious Goodwin and stuff like that. It all started with match betting isn't gambling. They've gained your trust at this point because they did teach you to make a £1,000 from match betting. The bookmaker never gets that kind of trust. I mean, bookmakers might send you friendly emails and offer you bonuses, but you know a bookmaker has not got your interests at heart. With the odds matching software sites, it's different. Now they have your trust, let's see what they do. So now, they encourage you to gamble. Examples include if a bookmaker offers a free bet if your horse comes second, and then there are two up football offers, they tell you to back and lay these. You lose a bit of money if you don't get the desired outcome. The problem is that you don't know your odds of winning the free bet, or in the case of the two up, Offer the money. Here, here's an example. Let's say you back and lay this team for a two-up offer. Now, I've just made up these odds, but the odds are close. Your stake here is a pound. You're betting a pound. You're not betting 50 pounds. You are betting a pound because that is how much you lose if you don't get the desired outcome. The question is, do you know the odds of getting the desired outcome? Because when you're wagering money without knowing your odds, you're gambling by anyone's definition of the word. Now, you might think that you've seen t teams go 2-0 up and then the score goes to 2-1 often. OK, how often? You see, what you think happens often enough is not the same as knowing that you're getting profitable odds. You might think, yeah, well, a quid, that's not a proper bet. It's just a tiny amount of money that you lose in the odds matching process. Yes, but you lose 10 of these and you've lost 10 quid. You can't pretend that that one pound is not a stake. What a lot of these guys do is tell you how much they've won when they win. However, you have to add all the little losses up to find out if you're really winning. Do you see what I see? Can you see what I see? Remember at the beginning, match betting isn't gambling? Remember that? I mean, for the welcome offer, offers the free bets, match betting isn't gambling. However, for the back, lay and hope bets, we have an example of match betting being gambling. The subtlety is this. At this stage, the match better may not even realise that some of his match betting has turned into gambling. It's a sneaky, subtle intro into gambling. The back and lay is just something he's always done to get free bets and to cash free bets. The match better may not notice that this is different. He may not notice there is no guaranteed money to overcome the small loss resulting from the back and lay. There is just the hope of money. You know normal punters, you know those punters who match betters look down on, they would call wagering money in the hope of winning money 
they would call that a bet. There are no fancy terms for this. It's a bet. So then there are the ACCA insurance schemes. So let's talk about ACCAs. So there's the sequential ACCA where each match takes place at a different time. The procedure is that you lay each bet off sequentially, stopping at a loser. The matches have to take place at different times for this method to work. This is because you have to know the result of each match before laying the next selection. The theory is that once you hit a loser, you will have got nearly all of your stake back. Now you can sit back and hope all the rest of your selections win, and if they do, you win a free bet. The free bet is supposed to be your profit. I call it a theory because the odds of the matches can drift. This means you can end up spending more money laying bets than you expected. This makes it a gamble. You'll be taking odds when there isn't a lot of money in the markets on the later matches. You might think that the odds are just as likely to come in as they are to go out. However, I don't think so. I mean, there isn't that much room for, uh, for the odds of a team at 1.2 to, to go down. In addition, the bookmakers have a big influence in controlling the odds. You often find with offers that bookmakers take measures to compensate for the offer. For example, say a bookmaker makes an in-play offer. Let's say they say you place a series of five in-play bets to get a free bet. You might find that this bookmaker's in-play odds are lower than those that the other bookmakers are offering. And you also have to ask yourself whether a bookmaker who is offer, offering ACCAs with one leg insurance would suppress the odds of the favourite to compensate for the one leg insurance. You also have to ask yourself if a bookmaker would deliberately create a close match for the odds by placing money in the exchange markets strategically. Remember, the markets will be relatively weak days before most matches. And the kind of money needed to influence an exchange market when the market's relatively weak would be absolutely nothing to a bookmaker. So a few years ago, the match betting gurus used to advise this. It was the latest amazing method. The ads would tell you what you'd make if you did a sequential ACCA at all the possible bookmakers every day. Some of these sites used to charge extra for their ACCA matching software. Now they say some match bettors got gubbed using this method. So we have a confession here. The match betting gurus advised this strategy and now they say it led to their customers getting gubbed. Their customers paid them for advice and in return they, they got advice that led to them getting gubbed. Was this just ignorance on their part? How could they not know? You have an ACCA where all the matches take place at different times and you do it repeatedly. Could the bookies be so thick as to not notice that? The odds are all at the, at the shortest odds possible. Could the bookies be so thick as to not notice that as well? And the sequential ACCA was promoted on just about every match betting site in the world. Could the bookies be so thick? as to not notice that as well? Could the bookies be so completely dense as to not notice those three things together? Did the match betting gurus not think that the bookies would notice this pattern? As I keep saying, gubbings are expensive. So anyway, the latest advice is the no lay acker. So this is gone, the match is being sequential. So we still have the shortest odds possible and the method on almost every single match betting site. The question is, are the bookmakers so dumb that they won't recognise a person using this method on a regular basis? I mean, the thing is, when you do stuff like this, you're kind of blowing your cover. You're telling the bookies who you are and what you're up to. They don't want to see people betting mathematically. They want punters who bet on opinion. You just have to look at the ads on the TV. 
you know, in between, you know, during sports po- programmes. They show guys with an opinion like, you know, I reckon Man United are going to beat Chelsea and uh, I gamble responsibly. They don't show some geeky mathematician with a calculator going, you know what, I've, I've invented this formula and I'm guaranteed a profit, whatever the outcome. Now, you might wonder why they don't gub people for this immediately. I mean, some people who do this, I mean, people who do this are representing themselves as one of three types of people. You could be a mathematician or a match better or a mug punter who bought the system over the internet. It's not only match betters who buy these systems, mug punters buy betting systems as well. So if they don't gub you straight away, it's likely that they're waiting to find out if you get interested in their other products. And in any case, this is an intro to high stakes gambling. The stakes that the gurus recommend go up to £50. You don't lay your selections so you can lose your whole stake using this method. So can you see how we've gone from match betting isn't gambling in small steps to betting fifty pounds that is uh, you know, betting a fifty pound bet that isn't covered? Anyway, using this system, the lower the odds, the more you will win on average. The numbers that they give as uh, profits are the maximum that you'll get if all the stars align, and that's the thing. They always max out on what you can get. You know, they max out on what you'll get with the free bet. However, there are hidden costs that they don't mention. So you have these ACAs and a ton of websites offer ACA matching software for around 15 quid a month. This isn't much if you're doing tons of high stakes ACAs, but it's a lot if you're just doing a few £10 ACAs. If you're doing £10 ACAs, you'll probably have to do around six or seven ACAs with very low odds and average expected results to pay your monthly charge. Only after doing that number of ACAs will you start making money. If you assume that the odds you are getting are based on real probabilities, the method does seem to be a plus EV gamble. However, Unless all of the matches are taking place close to the time you place your bet, you have the problem that the odds can move out. And with the no-lay acca, you're not laying. However, the odds moving out will screw up the guru's calculations regarding your percentage chances of winning and losing. The odds when the market has fully formed are more likely to reflect correct probabilities compared to when the market's weak. So, the next issue is what they call mug betting. As I've said, some of these websites really plug the casino. However, let's pretend we believe their claim that this will reduce your chances of getting gubbed. How much is the match better supposed to lose in the casino in ratio to his stake in the sports book? I mean, surely this amount has to be taken away from your expected wins from your hackers. I mean, the purpose of losing money in the casino is so that you're not, you know, is to provide yourself some sort of um, cover so that you're not gubbed for doing ackers. So is it what a £1 loss in the casino for a £25 acker or more? In what amounts should this money be bet? 10p at a time? 50p at a time? Or just 1p at a time? I mean, if you're doing, even if you're doing a 25 or £50 acker, you, do, you know, you, you may have an expected win rate on average. However, you're not winning so much that you can lose a ton of money in the casino. And the problem will be that you're betting 25 to £50 pounds in the sports book. However, in the casino, you're betting stakes like your granny when she goes to Scarborough for the weekend. Your profiles between the sports book and the casino won't look consistent. However, they don't say how much you should bet in the casino. They leave the players' actions in the casino completely open-ended. They're very specific on how much you should bet for sportsbook offers. When you go to the sportsbook, the gurus treat you like a child who needs guidance every step of the way, and then they just let you loose in the casino. Like you're a responsible adult, you should know what you're doing in the casino. So let's look at the directions that you can take after you've cashed out your welcome bonuses. You can carry on as normal, 
and just get what money's easy to take, or you can go down the path of doing ackers. On the acker route, you'll probably get gubbed, or if you lose control in the casino, you probably won't get gubbed. What's interesting is that the odds matching site is in danger of losing your £15 a month, whichever route you take. If you go the safe route, you'll start to question whether you're getting 15 per quid's worth of value. There won't be as many free bets around by this time, and there are plenty of sites that will give you this information for free. So you might ask yourself whether the odds matching software is saving you £15 a month compared to manually looking for back and lay odds. And if you haven't thought of that, you will now. On the red route, if you get gubbed and lose all your good accounts, you won't be getting value for your monthly subscription. And if you end up a casino gambler, well, you won't need the odds matching site for that, will you? However, the odds matching site can only get revenue from you if you, for people who have left the site, that is, if they've clicked on their affiliate links and become a casino player. Is it a coincidence that a lot of them plug the casino so much? With Ackers, I've already talked about the cost of the software, the cost of the odds changing, and the cost of betting in the casino to avoid gubbings. If you don't end up a casino player, you are likely to get gubbed. Gubbings cost money. You should question, will you get more money by doing Ackers until you get gubbed, or will you be getting free or will you be getting more money from the free bets over the next year or possibly for the rest of your life like i said a 5 pound free bet per week is worth around 200 pounds a year so is it worth getting gub for doing ackers well my opinion is no it's not worth it even if you're not getting that many free bets it may still be more profitable to play the long slow game This is not just about the money, it's also about the risk. Free bets are low risk, low risk to your bankroll, and ACA schemes are high risk and high risk to your bankroll. So that's what you're gambling with when you go for the no-lay ACA. You're almost definitely getting gubbed if you do a lot of these and you don't do any um, mindless gambling. The only way that you won't get gubbed is if you get hooked on some kind of casino game. Now another problem with no lay ackers is that you need a really big bankroll. Let's say the real odds average uh, 1.28. So this is the real odds. So you'd have taken a price a little bit lower than these odds and the lay odds would be slightly higher. You'd have a 29.1% chance of winning this acker a 40.8% chance of ending up with a free bet, and a 30.1% chance of losing the ACA. With free bets, this means you lose at least 20% 20 of your stake. That leaves almost an equal chance between a win and a loss. With an equal chance, you can expect losing streaks at some point, and remember, your bankroll will be dwindling when you end up with a free bet. You might be okay with that, but there's a very narrow window of odds that most people would be okay with. For example, if the average real odds are 1.4, you'd have taken a price slightly below this. Now you're only winning 18.6% of the time, you get a free bet 37.2% of the time, and you lose 44.2% of the time. Therefore, you'd have taken a price below 1.4 and you can already expect serious losing streaks. Now, although it should average out in the long term, you could easily lose your bankroll. In addition, you could get gubbed while you're in loss. Remember, my first gubbing was for using a system, but I'd lost at the bookie. So you can get gubbed even if you're in loss. I mean, I've I've heard people say, gurus, that you need a £1,000 bankroll to do £25 ackers. I mean, I don't know where they pluck that number from. Hang on. Um, 
A thousand pounds. A thousand pounds. Where have I heard that number before? Oh, right, yeah, it sounds suspiciously like the amount that people will have accumulated from their welcome offers. Now, I'm a backgammon and a poker player. You have losing streaks in both games. When players are on losing streaks and they have some really bad luck, they can lose it mentally and start to play angrily, aggressively and badly. This is known as steaming in backgammon circles and going on tilt in poker circles. And these are such well-known concepts that almost be every beginner poker book has a chapter on how not to go on tilt. Even experienced and good players can go on tilt, although beginners are probably more prone to it. Now let's transfer this to the no-lay acca scenario. If someone doing Akers experiences a series of losses, this is likely to affect his mood in a similar manner. So, how could a person express their anger or low mood, or the equivalent of tilt, um, in the in, in the Akka scenario? I mean, they can't express their mood through Akers because there, there's a limited number of Akers that you can do at the bookmakers in a day. So how can they express their mood in a similar way to a poker player on tilt? Well, I'll give you a clue. Boy, does this casino thing keep coming up. Another coincidence? You also have to remember that backgammon and poker players have more self-awareness when it comes to mood swings because they're familiar with the terms steaming and tilting. And, so, and because they're familiar with these terms, they're usually able to realise at some point that they are steaming or on tilt and quit playing for a while. In other words, the awareness of the potential for mood swings can stop them from going too far. The types of players who go from matched better to no layaka may not have had any real experience of gambling. They're less likely to understand how a mood swing may drive them towards bad gambling. Therefore, they might not be able to stop until a lot of damage has been done to their bankroll. This type of information is not presented to players who are encouraged to go to casinos. They put the amounts you can win for the no lay acres in different coloured fonts so it stands out. Buried somewhere in their article, they might mention bankroll. However, do they warn their customers? about the potential for mood swings associated with gambling and the potential effects. I've never seen this. Whenever you look at an offer, you have to look at the full picture. The gurus just want you to see the big numbers in fonts that make them stand out. Gambling is about taking good risks and rejecting the bad risks. Now, you're probably wondering how I can be so sure that you will be gubbed for just doing Akers. Well, no one can be 100% sure, but wait until I explain more, because this is going to be an eye-opener for a lot of people. So, to understand the Akers, we have to go back and remember what the bookies did after you collected your welcome bonuses. I explained this path before, However, not everyone becomes a gambler at point five. There are a couple of other paths that you can take. Most people just c continue to collect offers and they get gubbed. So why did they get gubbed? What did this person do that the bookmakers didn't like? Or rather, what didn't this person do that the bookmakers would have liked? Well, there's only one thing I can think of that you can do in a bookmaker that's apart from just collecting bonuses, and that is to gamble. So, by process of elimination, I assume that if you don't gamble, you will get gubbed. The, there is another line, the line I took, and that's to mimic a gambler, but th this isn't about that. What I want you to understand is that when a bookie gives anything away, it creates a massive advertising network. Let's say you'd never been to a casino or bookie and you never intended going to one and you were surfing the net and you came across an ad like this 
and you can see it's a bookmaker ad. Well, you might ignore the ad. It's not a lot of money, and most people who don't go to casinos and bookmakers are suspicious of them. However, if you saw an ad like this, and it wasn't from a bookie, you might be interested. There's more money, and the ad isn't from a bookie. What the odds matching software providers do is that they add up all the bookies' offers and tell you what you can make in total. Each bookmaker is only giving you probably an average of 10 or 20 pounds, so this creates a massive advertising network. There are loads of businesses offering access to odds matching software, and each of these businesses have tons of affiliates. So it appears that it's about getting people through the bookmaker's door. And if they don't gamble, they get gubbed. So let's look at the Acker funnel. Now, this is pretty similar to the welcome bonus funnel. If you were a match better, you won't have to sign up to bookmakers or ad odds matching software sites because you'll already have these accounts. Again, the odds matching software sites will often bundle the money up across all bookmakers and count the average amount of money you will make in a month if you did all available ACRs. This again creates a massive advertising network. So you learn how to do ACRs and then you place ACRs. What you have to understand is that the bookies know when they've given away a plus EV ACR. I mean, if it was just one bookie, it could be a mistake. But when it's almost all of them, you have to assume they've offered the plus EV bet deliberately. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if the money they lose from these ACRs is in their advertising budget. So, when someone leaves bait, you need to think twice whether to bite. Now, the reason I wouldn't do these is because doing an ACA with average odds of 1.2 doesn't really mimic a gambler. However, back to the question, why am I so sure that people doing ACAs will get gubbed eventually? Well, if they will gub someone for taking offers only and not gambling, why would it be any different for someone who takes plus EV bets only and avoids minus EV gambling? However, players might be allowed to do these ACAs a bit longer before getting gubbed compared to players who just went for bonus offers, and I'll explain why. When you cash a normal bonus, there's almost no risk. Your bet is covered and the result of the football match or horse race will not affect you emotionally. There's, therefore, there's no fear of losing, there's no excitement of winning, and there's no emotional training going on at all. With the Akers, it's different. You'll experience fear or disappointment of losing, and the thrills associated with winning. So there are psychological effects with Akers that you don't get with normal bonuses. So let's have a look at these. So now I want to talk about how going down the Acker route instead of the safe route can change you psychologically. The first thing they do is rebrand casino gambling. They call it mug betting or having a flutter. Your motive for being in the casino is attributed to anything but gambling. I'm talking about at least two of the biggest websites that offer access to their odds matching software for a monthly charge. They encourage their customers to use other bookies' products such as Casino and Bingo to make out their a mug. I've looked through these odds matching sites' definition of mug betting and there's barely a form of gambling that casinos and bookmakers offer that is missing from their list. What I'm saying is, almost every form of gambling is included in their definition of mug betting. I mean, how do you think problem gambling starts? Do you think a person wakes up one day and decides to bet his life savings in the casino? Or do you think it starts with a flutter on a slot machine or a roulette wheel and it escalates from there? So, their players are making money from cashing bookmakers' welcome bonuses. As a result, they trust the owners of the software site and are, are grateful to them. 
Can you think of any other way you could get a population, some of whom will be non-gamblers, into a casino trying out all the games? Another thing that happens is that the player gets desensitised to losing money with the no layakas. When you do no layakas, your bankroll will go up and down several times your normal stake. Once you get used to that, it's possible you won't feel so bad when you lose similar amounts in the casino. And you will have been introduced to the casino before the no layakas. On some websites, you get told it's okay to risk money that you've won by match betting. This is an unprofessional mindset, and it's actually the classic de- degenerate gambler mindset that they're teaching. The degenerate gambler thinks they're ahead, so the money doesn't matter so much. The money you've made from match betting is your money. Just because you got it easily, it doesn't mean it's okay to risk it any more than money, money that you work for. The money looks the same feels the same, can be spent the same, and can be saved the same, whether you work for it or got it through match betting. And while you're getting desensitised to losing money, you're also getting sensitised to the excitement of gambling. So you have an acker and you need your team to score. So you're thinking, will I win, will I lose, will I win, will I lose? Oh, please, please, God, make my team score. And this is important because there's a high emotional component to gambling. The mind has been trained to feel these emotions. Now let's say a person gets gubbed at the point of having doing lots and lots of no layakas, but is told they can use any gambling product, but they can't have any offers of any description. Okay, most people can walk away and say, I had a good run and I'll go and find something else to do. However, there are some people who will chase those thrills and end up gambling to get those thrills. Then there's the issue of mood swings that can potentially lead to poor gambling decisions. I mean, these are usually going to be temporary. However, a minority might make a habit of turning to gambling for an emotional outlet. And all this started with match betting as not gambling, which was true at the beginning, but then that changed. There are two keys to this whole process. Firstly, the assertion that gubbings can be reduced by playing in the casino, and this is told to the match better very early in the process. Secondly, the step-by-step process from match better to small stakes gambler to large stakes gambler together with the ongoing advice to go into the casino. To me, this looks like a behavioural shaping process, how to turn people into gamblers by a step-by-step process. I mean, very few people will go that far, and most will drop out of their business funnel early on. However, for those who do, the consequences can be devastating, not just for them, but for anyone they come in contact with. In addition, there are vulnerable people. Um, Who are the vulnerable? Well, people who've had gambling problems in the past. And you might think, what would such people be doing there? Well, they got told that match betting isn't gambling. And it wasn't to start with. And then it started to change. And even even then, you know, they get to the match betting site and they get told that playing casino games is called mug betting. And you might think that an ex-gambler wouldn't be so stupid to fall for that, but some might not be intelligent. And even for those who are, the mind can play tricks on addicts. Then you've got people with various kind of mental issues And people with problems can be vulnerable to increased drug and alcohol use. And some seek escape from their problems by gambling. And there's a type of gambler actually called an escape gambler who uses gambling to escape from life's problems. And they tend to like games that give them an instant result, such as slots and scratch cards, casino games. And then there are people who are desperate for money. 
A lot of people look for ways to make money online when they've lost their job due to redundancy or whatever. Um, And people in this situation will often clutch at straws to try and make money. I mean, we've all been ripped off at some time or another, and most of the time we can get over the loss of money. However, when you're dealing with something that's potentially addictive, it can create a personality change in some people, and that can have a knock-on effect on people around them. So a person can be left with a lot more problems than just the loss of money. So this is a business funnel. The business funnel is a standard concept, especially among internet marketers. The reason it's funnel shaped is because they get loads of customers coming in at the top of the funnel, and as they move down the funnel, customers start to drop out. So at the bottom of the funnel, there'll usually only be a small percentage of customers compared to those at the top. So anyway, you start by collecting welcome bonuses and learning to trust the odds matching providers. Mug betting, aka casino gambling, will be mentioned as a possible solution to gubbings, but you may not feel the need to mug bet yet. You will read threads on forums from other match bettors saying that they've been gubbed. Some will even list the bookmakers who they've been gubbed by. So you'll have an awareness of both gubbings and mug betting early on. So the next stage is small risk gambling. And at this stage, you're being trained that it's okay to lose a small amount of money. The gambling is disguised as the back and lay method is identical to how you placed a qualifying bet, but the results are not identical for offers where there is no guaranteed profit. You may have had some gubbings by this stage and you'll have heard about mug betting for some time now and it may be on your mind if you haven't already started it yet. And you may be doing some variation of ACCAs where you lay off selections. So next we move on to gambling high risk. The no lay acker trains you to believe that it's okay to lose a larger amount of money. You become desensitised to losing larger amounts of money and sensitised to the excitement. And you'll probably be getting more gubbings by this stage. They may tell you that experienced match bettors do no lay ackers. And in this context, experienced just means people who have run out of the big welcome offers and you might move on to higher stakes in the casino. Now, you might not think that this is you passively going down the funnel. However, it could be someone you know, it could be your inheritance going down the toilet, and as I've said, there are vulnerable people. So, where did this odds matching software idea come from in the first place? You see, it's not rocket science to cash out the bookmaker's bonuses, Anyone who's reasonable at maths can figure this out and they wouldn't need software to do it it either. So, is the whole system controlled? And if so, who by? You see, there are two main reasons I ask this. Firstly, the software appears similar on all odds matching sites. And secondly, all of these odds matching sites teach almost identical methods. So all these match bettors get herded into these match betting websites and receive the same education. Now you would have thought there would be a bit more variation both in the software and the education process if it wasn't controlled. I'm not saying that it is controlled, but if you look at any other subject, you would find a lot more differences of opinion. But there appears to be little difference of opinion among match betting gurus. Controlling the match betting education process is important because other people who have better methods that are difficult for bookies to detect will never get these methods out to the masses. So any other method would get pushed into the background. And in this video, you can see how the whole match betting funnel works well, both for the bookmakers and the match betting gurus. So I'll leave you to speculate on the possibilities here. However, it's important to be aware of the possibilities here and not just blindly trust what anyone tells you. So that's all for this video. 
And if you're interested to learn how I match spurt, please subscribe.